Today, we're gonna cover five essential game jam tips. Let's do it. Candlesan here. I've done over 40 game jams in the past decade. I feel like game jamming is a great way to explore ideas, develop community, find creative fulfillment, and learn more about the art and craft of making games. Let's dive into it. Number one. Focus on learning, not accomplishment. Too often, when people get ready to do a game jam, they psych themselves out and think, how am I going to make sure that this game is really good? Or maybe people think, I can't do a jam. I don't know enough yet. The way to get around some of these expectations that you might have on yourself is to gauge your success not by the result of the game that you make, but by how much you learn during the jam. Treat any final game as a byproduct of a learning process. As long as you got better at making games, then the game jam was a success. Think about something that you could learn. Maybe you want to learn a new engine. Maybe you want to experiment with a new illustration technique. Maybe you want to attempt multiplayer and learn how to use a new networking library. Maybe you're an artist who wants to get better at layering textures for outdoor environments. Now, let's say that you want to focus on learning more about game design in general. Well, one way you could do it is by just making something that follows tried and true principles. It's one thing to learn from a book, a YouTube video, or a classroom setting, but nothing beats hands-on experience. Maybe you wanna get experience at making a card game, or you could get more experience in working in 2D or 3D. Sometimes a great thing to do is just to recreate an old video game classic. Have you ever made a match three game? A city builder? An endless runner? How about a physics-based game like Angry Birds? Not only will making one of these game types give you insight into all the invisible details that go into making these games, they'll also help you better understand what makes these games tick. I get asked a lot, how do people actually tune a game? The truth is, most games are tuned through trial and error, or <laughs> lovingly done by altering the values and code until you get a result that seems fun. Even if you don't have any major innovations while you're exploring an existing game genre, you're definitely going to get experience in tuning games. Okay, game jam tip number two, use some task tracking. This is just a good production practice in general, but it also has a lot of benefits for game jamming. First of all, it lets you scope your game as you're planning it out. It's really helpful to know all the different things that you want to do. By task tracking, you can prioritize what you want to get done. A lot of times you might have a list of 12 to 15 things that you want to be able to do, and you need to be able to pick out the items that have the most value right now. And if you're working on a team, task tracking will allow you to divvy up the work and have visibility on what other teammates are doing. Task tracking allows you to make sure that you're able to coordinate with your teammates while still having a sense of accomplishment as you check things off this to-do list. It's extremely motivating to be able to take a to-do list and see those items get completed as you knock them out. One of the things that you also get by doing some task tracking is it helps you to maintain your creative focus. In any sort of creative effort, switching tasks is expensive. Not only does it take away time from your task at hand, but the context switch can lower the quality of your thinking, distracting you from the work that you have in front of you. Task tracking can serve as sort of a notepad to get an idea out of your head so that you can free up that mental bandwidth to get back to the task that you're working on. If you've never used task tracking before, I'd recommend Trello for any game jam. It's great because it's available on both Mac, PC, it's web-based, it works on mobile, it allows a team to collaborate, multiple people can all share access to the same Trello board, it's fairly lightweight, and it's very easy to get started. With just four columns, you can get started with task tracking for a game jam. You just need four columns that are labeled idea pool, to do, doing now, and done. You can create simple cards that you place into the different columns. Each card represents a task that you want to accomplish. And as you accomplish those tasks, you move them between the different lists. Anybody in the team can move a task between the columns to indicate what they're working on. And then they can move it to the done column when it's finished. It's easy to reprioritize tasks simply by moving them up and down the list. Game Jam tip number three. Take care of yourself. Be sure to eat, sleep, get sunlight, 
and some exercise. Back when I was in college, I used to pull these crazy all-nighters trying to finish my homework or major projects. I'm not sure that was such a good idea. Try to prepare your nourishment in advance. If you're a caffeine drinker, have some of your caffeine of choice ready to go, but make sure you don't over-caffeinate. Good quality sleep is an important part of a game jam as well. When I do a game jam, I follow a rule to not drink any caffeine past 2 p.m. Then, as the late hours come along, I have a rule that when I get tired, I go to bed. More often than not, the excitement of working on a game jam keeps me up a little bit later than normal anyway. To make sure I'm getting enough sleep, I always skip the alarm clock the next morning. When I do get up, I go out and get some sunlight as well. Our bodies have a natural circadian rhythm that responds to sunlight. Get lots of sunlight into your eyes, on your eyeballs, and on your skin when you wake up in the morning. And that'll really maximize a productive game jam day. Game jamming is a wonderful activity. It's a ton of fun and you can get a lot out of it. So you want it to be a positive experience. If you ruin your health over a jam or lose sleep or don't eat well, not only is your performance during the jam going to suffer, but you're going to demotivate yourself from wanting to do a game jam in the future. Be nice to your body and set yourself up for healthy expectations so that you can have many fun jams into the future. Game jam tip number four. Try to have a first playable about 25% into the jam. One of my favorite game jams to participate in is Ludum Dare. It usually starts on Fridays around 6 p.m. in my time zone, that's Pacific time, and goes until Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Now this timing means that for the 25% guideline, I wanna have a first playable before I go to bed that Friday night. Now some of you may be wondering, what counts as a first playable? I'll admit it's a bit subjective, but it doesn't mean that it has to be fun. What you want to look for is that it's something that runs and it shows a shadow of what the final game is going to be. Ideally, it puts some pixels on the screen and maybe it takes in some input from the player, but not always. The goal of the 25% first playable rule is to just avoid working on infrastructure or unused assets too much up front. One trap I've fallen into on some jams is to work so much on tools, serialization, flexible game systems, but nothing that actually resembles the final gameplay. Well, one thing leads to another and pretty soon it's Sunday morning and you've got just a couple hours left in the jam and you're way out of scope and have almost no viable path to make the game fun in the time that remains. Here are some examples of what a first playable might look like. If you're making an endless runner, maybe you have a character that's just constantly running to the right. If you have a shooter, maybe you have a ship that can move around and shoot. Here is the first playable for a game I made that was about forest fighting. I defined at this time for my jam that a first playable would be simply a programmatically generated trees, which then have fire spread from one to another. Since it was a game about fighting forest fires, I could immediately tell that the fire spreading was going to be an interesting part of the game. Having a first playable quickly has many benefits. Now, obviously it gives you a concrete idea that you can anchor to, but it also guarantees that as you start to run out of time, you can allocate tasks and know that you'll have something playable at the end. If you can get the jam to be in a fun state, you can focus on iterating while preserving that fun. It also lets you make better decisions about how you're going to spend your time. When you have a concrete game sitting in front of you, you'll make smarter decisions about what you want to work on next. Tip number five, keep your team's capabilities in mind. Ask the people on your team what they want to do, what they're good at, and what they want to learn. Ask each person how much time they're going to be able to commit to working on the jam. You're not doing this to give anyone a hard time about how much time they're able to dedicate or guilt anyone into spending more time. Your goal is simply to understand what resources are available to you so you can scope your game accordingly. I recently made a music rhythm runner set in a 3D environment, and a top reason we picked this game style was that we had two artists who are more comfortable in 3D than 2D, and we had a dedicated musician on the team as well. If you're interested in learning more about that jam, I'll leave a link in the description below. And that wraps up five game jam tips. If you found these tips useful, I'd appreciate if you could share this video with a friend if I earned it. For those of you who are experienced at game jams, what tips do you have? 
Let me know in the comments and I'll probably make a follow-up video. Making games is hard, but you can do it if you put in the time and effort to get it done. Game jams are a great way to get more experience in a safe and fun environment. Happy game making.